Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Hosea. The Lord tells Hosea the harsh punishment that he will mete out for the people of Israel for their unfaithfulness. Yet, he holds out hope for eventual forgiveness. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go, take for yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom. For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, name him Jezreel, which means God will scatter. For in a little while, I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. Then the Lord said to him, name her Lo Ruhama, which means not pitied or loved. For I will no longer have pity on the house of Israel or forgive them. But I will have pity on the house of Judah and I will save them by the Lord their God. I will not save them by bow or by sword or by war or by horses or by horsemen. When she had weaned Lo Ruhama, she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said, name him Lo Amai, which means not my people. For you are not my people and I am not your God. Yet, the number of the people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which shall be neither measured nor numbered. 
and in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. With the psalm, I will read the odd-numbered verses and invite you to respond with the even-numbered verses. You've been gracious to your land, O Lord. You have restored the good fortune of Jacob. You have withdrawn all your fury and turned yourself from your wrathful indignation. Will you be displeased with us forever? Will you prolong your anger from age to age? Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Truly, his salvation is very near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Truth shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Righteousness shall go before him, and peace shall be a pathway for his feet. A reading from the epistle to the Colossians. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also, you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God and raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses. Erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands, he set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or of observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come but the substance belongs to Christ. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Lord, Lord. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts, to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Gospel of the Lord. Please pray with me. Oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. I think we've got the mic now, but if you couldn't hear us just now, that was the collect of the day, which is on the first page of your bulletin. Um, it's always a good idea to pray and reflect on the collect of the day. In our Anglican tradition, we can read it as a little mini sermon on the readings that are given to us for the day. So if you ever miss church or you couldn't quite make out the sermon, just go back to the collect and you'll get the good bits. Um, I also chose to begin with the collect this morning because I need a little protection. <laughs> I don't know about you. Um, and I need increased and multiplied mercy because when I looked at the readings for this week and saw what I was coming back to, beginning with Hosea, I thought, God have mercy upon me. <laughs> All joking aside, um, the book of Hosea is incredibly challenging, not just this first passage. It more or less goes on from here. These are just the first 10 verses, and it continues as a theme. The history of the book of Hosea is a complicated and dangerous one. Uh, it has been used by traditions which take the Bible literally to justify domestic violence against women. 
and we cannot set that aside lightly. So you might be thinking, well, why are you even talking about it all? Aren't you supposed to just preach on the gospel? And that's true. <laughs> um, there are lots of good pithy rules about how we preach, um, one of which is always preach on the gospel. I think that can be a little bit of a cop-out, though, given that we are given a full lectionary. So for those of you who don't know, um, we here at Christ Church do not choose these readings week to week for ourselves. If we did, I assure you, Carol and I would not have chosen Hosea. <laughs> um, we work from the Revised Common Lectionary, which was an ecumenical project um, between several denominations, uh, mostly Protestant, but including the Roman Catholic Church. So if you were to hop over to several other churches this Sunday, you would hear all more or less the same readings being offered. And the lectionary is assembled in the way that it is. Lectionary, by the way, is a word that means a collection of readings. Think about a bestiary or a breviary, you know, books that are these collections of, in the case of a breviary, short prayers, or a bestiary a collection of facts about beasts. Um, so the lectionary is a collection of readings, and it is intentional on our part. The designers and the compilers of the lectionary both hoped that certain messages would come through from week to week, and then in the Anglican tradition, we write our collects, again, as these little sermons upon any of the readings for the week, but they also hoped that the Holy Spirit might speak through texts that seemingly are not connected to one another um, in ways that are both subtle and profound. So this morning, I don't want to shy away from Hosea or from Ephesians, and uh, certainly not from the gospel. Um, one of the great gifts of any seminary education, but certainly in my case, is um, good professors. So our professor of Hebrew scripture at Virginia Theological Seminary, Dr. Judy Fentress Williams, when we got to the book of Hosea in our Hebrew scripture class, she did not shy away from the very difficult and painful history of this book. But she reminded us, and she's a Baptist minister, by the way, um, she reminded us that when our traditions, although our traditions, particularly the Anglican tradition, do not take scripture literally, we must always take it seriously. And so she invited us into our contemplation of Hosea and other difficult prophets through this lens. Hosea was the key to me that unlocked a larger understanding of how to approach difficult and painful and repulsive, sometimes even, biblical passages. So Dr. Judy walked us through this idea that Hosea in his day was speaking to a group of mostly Israelite men who would have had very strong, instinctive feelings about this idea of marrying a wife of whoredom. It was abhorrent to them socially. You can imagine that if Hosea had been preaching from the pulpit and you all heard this, that his listeners would have physically recoiled from him hearing this idea, much less than siring three children on this woman. And Dr. Judy told us that one of the most important things we can do with scripture, especially when it makes us uncomfortable, is to do that little bit of historical research to understand if we don't understand why something is in here, why would a loving God ask us to read about these violent and, and painful images? That's usually a good sign that we need to go deeper. And so Dr. Judy, giving us that little bit of historical context, said, what is Hosea trying to get them to understand? And in this case, she says he's trying to get them to understand how deeply broken their own relationship to God is. Hosea says, for the land, Israel, commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. He is telling them, you have made a covenant with the Lord your God, and you have broken it like a wife of whoredom. So you can imagine that this would have had an incredibly powerful impact on his listeners. And it is, in fact, the very power of that metaphor that is then so shocking when we get to the last line of this reading. Yet the number of the people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea. This is covenant language going all the way back to Abraham in Genesis, which can be neither measured nor numbered and in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. So we've just been told by the prophet 
that we are the worst kind of betrayers. We are the worst kind of sinners. We are something that would make ourselves sick to hear about being described. And yet, God will have mercy. God will claim us as children of the living God. Now, the impact and the importance of this message does not for us as modern readers take away from the difficulty of taking Hosea seriously. And so again, thanks be to God for Dr. Judy. She used this as the idea of a broken metaphor. Metaphors help us understand things that are beyond our understanding in human language, like, for example, our relationship to God, God's relationship to us. But they're contextual, they're specific to their time and place. There are all sorts of things that we could say now specific to iPhones or iPads or you know, anything of our modern lives that would make no sense to the generations 300 years before us or maybe even 300 years after us. But they would still speak to us. Uh, we can think of meme culture for uh, those of us in the audience who are uh, on the younger side or who work on social media, that there, we see images or we hear phrases and it immediately conveys a deeper meaning. So in this case in scripture, Hosea is using an image that would have drawn an instinctive reaction from his hearers and is using it to teach a deeper lesson about our relationship to God. But that doesn't mean that that image itself is our relationship to God. The metaphor is not reality. And we now can look back at this metaphor and say that metaphor is broken. Metaphors can become idols. We can engrave them on our hearts, as the prophet Jeremiah says, or in our minds. And if we engrave them over the word and the deeper truth of God and God's commandments, they can become idols. So this takes us, indeed, to our gospel for the day. Many people this morning will be preaching on the Lord's Prayer, and rightfully so. It is so deeply familiar to us. There's so much to explore. We could spend weeks and weeks just unpacking this prayer. But what I want us to go to is actually the second half of the gospel, where all of a sudden we have all of these images that might seem kind of disconnected and random and disjointed to us. A friend who is lending someone three loaves of bread and someone else isn't getting up because the children are in bed and there are things about scorpions and eggs and fish and snakes and... This is all metaphor, <laughs> right? It's teaching us something deeper about what God is trying to say to us. So in this case, when Jesus gives his disciples a new prayer to say, he is not teaching a prayer that supersedes, that replaces the historic prayers of Judaism but he is in fact helping his disciples to sing a new song. This is the deep truth of our relationship to God, of God's relationship to us, that God is a parent, that God's name is holy, that we await the coming of God's kingdom, that God gives us our daily bread, that God sustains us, that God forgives us even when we cannot imagine forgiving each other or forgiving ourselves. And God protects us. The evangelist here, Luke, or his sources, when he says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish. And here the evangelist is speaking in a metaphor of his time because there were two groups of new converts to this tradition that became called Christianity. There were people coming from the Jewish tradition and there were people coming from the Greek-speaking tradition, Gentiles. And because this movement of Christianity originated with the Jewish people, many Jews Many Jewish Christians thought that in order to become a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, that everyone must take on all of the practices of first century Judaism. We hear these alluded to in the letter of Paul to the, uh, to the Ephesians, I believe, or Colossians. 
Do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or of observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. These were, and in some cases still are, practices of Judaism in the first century that some Jewish Christians would lord over Gentile Christians who didn't understand them and didn't practice them. And so when a Gentile Christian would come seeking food nourishment as a follower of Christ, some Jewish Christians dismissed or belittled them because they didn't follow or adhere to these practices. So the Gentile convert comes as a child asking for a fish, and the Jewish Christians, more deeply established in the tradition, give them a snake. The child comes asking for an egg, and they are given a scorpion, belittlement, derision, dismissal, discrimination. Paul takes up this theme in his letters, this was a deep inner conflict of Paul's, whether to be Jewish or to be Greek. He believed that it was possible to be both. He was a living embodiment of both. He is a Jew of Jewish heritage, and yet he was raised in the Greek-speaking tradition. He was educated as a Greek thinker. He is the ideal person to be able to speak in metaphor to both sides of this conflict. He can speak to the Jews as a Jew and to the Greeks as a Greek. And we hear this because he does not only say, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food or of drink or observing festivals, new moons or Sabbath, but also to the Greeks. Do not let anyone disqualify you insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions, pupped up without cause by a human way of thinking, philosophy, and empty deceit. He's speaking to the Greeks there. This isn't just about putting down the Jews. Everyone is lording human traditions and human practices over one another. And so both the evangelist Luke and the apostle Paul are saying to their listeners, both Jew and Greek, do not make an idol out of your traditions. Do not make an idol out of the metaphors that have helped you to understand and access God. At the end of the day, the most important thing is the deepest truth of God's love for us and the love that we must respond with to God. How does this speak to us today as Christ Church here in Rockville or to the wider church? I think this is very important for where we are, searching for a new rector. Because in any time of transition, instability, turmoil, questioning, as the early church itself was deeply mired in for centuries, we cling to the things that make us feel safe. We cling to the structures that we believe have held us up. And it is always worth asking, are these in fact, the things that we cling to most tightly, are these in fact the deepest truths of God's love and God's commandments? Or are they graven images? Are they metaphors that are broken? Are they traditions that we have graven on our hearts and our minds in place of the knowledge and love of God? I don't have answers. I don't have specific things that I'm thinking of. This is not a subtle dig at anyone. This is just a general rule. If we are actually asking God for God's guidance, for God's direction, for, as the Collect says, our ruler and guide, if we really want that of God, then we must do as the evangelist does, as the apostle Paul does, and examine our hearts and our minds to see where we might be building up idols in place of the knowledge and love of God. So as Paul writes, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, the incarnate truth of God's love for us, Continue to live your lives in him, rooted deeply, yes, in the traditions of the Hebrew scriptures, in the traditions of Judaism, and built up in him, yes, as the Greek-speaking converts built the church far beyond anything anyone ever could have imagined, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, 
as Jesus taught us to pray the simplest and deepest truths of our faith, abounding in thanksgiving. Hold fast to our head, from whom the whole body, Jew and Greek, newcomer, longtime parishioner, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. Amen. stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are found on page 387 of the Red Book of Common Prayer. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come and share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. For all those dealing with the aftermath of gun violence.
for the people of Ukraine. Hasten, O God, the coming of your kingdom, and grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty, Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. We may be few in number, but boy, are we mighty. I'll tell you, I'm impressed. I asked Anna ahead of time some basic questions like, do we have to vest? She said, well, it's up to you. So obviously some of us chose not to, but the acolytes who arrived in their t-shirts chose to vest, which I understand. I would not have minded their t-shirts, but my mother would have been distressed. <laughs> All right, let's see. Katie has a, a guest today. You're on. So um, I would like to introduce my fiance, Alicia DePaolo, who is visiting with us this week. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, she is very glad to be able to be with us. Um, Alicia is both a rabbinical student in training um, and also a professional singer, and so she spends most of her Sundays either teaching Hebrew school to small Jewish children or um, singing for Episcopal churches for the most part. So <laughs> um, we are uh, very grateful to have her with us on a rare Sunday that she was able to turn down a gig to be here with us. Whoa. So um, we'll be around briefly after the service if you'd like to come by and say hi. Good, thank you. Emily. Emily, you are going to England. Yes. Do you know how hot it is there? <laughs> Just checking. I wanted just to welcome everybody and to let you all know this is the first year that our campus has been pesticide free, which is exciting. It also means that the beauty and what some may think not so beauty of God's creation is popping out all over. So you may notice in some of our pathways that there are green bits that didn't used to be there. And so we are on the lookout for gardeners who may want to come and help maintain our beautiful campus. So please consider it. And if you happen to see volunteer plants that are in places that they didn't used to be, just know that it is for the beauty of God's entire creation. And thank you for your patience. All right, are there other announcements? You can kind of tell it's summertime. All right, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Make good your vows to the Most High.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord to shore forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. stand for the post-communion prayer. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember the poor, visit the sick, pray for peace and work for justice, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.